My name's Greg. Welcome if you're visiting. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, <clears throat> which I normally do that relates somehow to our um, Bible reading and the sermon we're going to have later. And my question's a, a bit of a dangerous one, but what warnings have you either not seen or ignored and run into trouble with? Has anyone got any examples of warnings you've... Yes? Right, everything, Jasmine says, everything her parents told her when she was a teenager, she had to do it the hard way. Okay. Um, well, we were on our honeymoon, Anne and I, heading off to Queensland, um, and we happened to get up near Stanthorpe, and we were actually watching, they were all vintage, vintage uh, machinery and stuff. Uh, me being a farmer, I was quite interested in it either side of the road, and I had no idea we'd just passed through one house where there was an 80k sign. So... As I'm straightening up after passing this one house and looking at all this vintage machinery, I look in my mirror only to see blue flashing lights and a police car that was parked with his nose just around the corner of this one house. And uh, anyway, I thought I'd better go back and see what, what's, what's the problem. He didn't actually chase me. And um, he said, he held up his um, speed camera thing and he said, you were doing 90 eight kilometres an hour. And I said, yes, I'm under 100. He said, don't you know you're in an 80 zone? And I'm going, what? So, um, yes, that was a time when um, I did not follow what I thought I should have been doing. I should have been paying more attention. So I couldn't blame him. I could only blame myself. So to later today, we're actually going to be thinking this morning uh, about Deuteronomy and uh, where God tells us to actually obey uh, his word in the Bible and what uh, and how that will go with the Israelites that, uh, who are obeying God's commands. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to commence with our first song. Unfortunately, we don't have any musos today. They're on holidays as well. So we're going to follow music on the overhead. Heavenly Father, thanks for your loving God. Thanks, Lord, you revealed your love to us through your word in the Bible. Help us, Lord, today as we think about that word how we are to obey you and how do we apply that to our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing the first song.
Please be seated. The scriptures urge us to confess our sins. So together we're going to confess uh, a confession that appears on the, on the screen. For turning away from you and ignoring your will in our lives, Father, forgive us. For behaving just as we wish without thinking of you, Father, forgive us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us, Father, forgive us. For failing you, not only by what we do, but also by our thoughts and words, Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. Father, we have failed you often and humbly ask your forgiveness. Help us so to live that others may see your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Bible tells us that as far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Amen. Uh, we're going to have the Bible readings, and Simon is going to pop up again and read the Bible readings. So grab your Bibles. The first Bible reading this morning is from the book of Deuteronomy. Um, it's found on page 177 in your pew Bibles, page 177. And you might just put your finger underneath that page so that we're going to, we're going to flip forward um, to um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Page 177, Deuteronomy chapter 5. <clears throat> Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our fathers that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. At that time, I stood between the Lord and you to declare to you the words of the Lord because you were afraid of the fire and did not go up to the mountain. And he said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. If you flip over now to chapter 6, on page 178, beginning at verse 1. These are the commands, decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commandments that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and of your gates. This is the word of the Lord. If you'd like to turn forward now to Psalm 119. which is found on page um, 607 in the Pew Bibles, page 607, beginning at verse 25. I am laid low in the dust. Preserve my life according to your word. I recounted in my, my ways and you answered me. Teach me your decrees. Let me understand the teaching of your precepts. Then I will meditate on your wonders. My soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Keep me from deceitful ways. Be gracious to me through your law. I have chosen the way of truth. I have set my heart on your laws. I hold fast to your statutes, O Lord. Do not let me be put to shame. I run at the path 
Sorry, I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. And finally, if you'd like to turn now to page 597, 597 to Matthew chapter 4. Beep pardon? 957? 957. Oh, sorry, did I say 597? 957, correction, 957. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It's written, Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they, will lift up your, and, they, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour. And he, this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and angels came and attended him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Simon. Uh, We are going to have a kid's talk. Actually, we're going to have a song and then we're going to have a kid's talk. So the song is This I Believe. After that, we'll have a kid's talk, and I know we haven't got many kids, but kids, come up the front for the talk, please. And I'll actually, I'll need Keith and Chloe uh, to lend a bit of a hand.
So that's a two for, we've actually just sung our creed. So that's a creed in song this morning. Please take a seat. Uh, children, would you come up the front and if you, a couple of you come up and give me a hand to hold things, that'd be handy. Chloe and Keith. Everyone looks rugged up and nice and warm. Well, today's, in today's reading, we heard that God gave his people Israel a relationship agreement, that they would obey God's instructions and so that it may go well with them. They would increase in number in the land that he gave them uh, and they had everything they needed. All they had to do was to obey God and things were going to go well. The big danger, and I'll repeat that, the big danger was that God's people would forget about God and they'd want to do things their own way um, and everything they wanted to do. So children, what do we see around us that warn us about dangers? When there's something dangerous, what warns us that there's a danger? Do any of you know? What sort of things tell us there's dangers around? Right up, we're going to jump to the congregation. Road signs. Road signs, yep. What else? Leslie? Pain. 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 <laughs> yes, pain. Yes, right out. Flashing lights. Yep. Anything else? Adrenaline. There you go. Yep. Mum yelling at us. There you go. Um, so I brought a couple of things along to things that we've done. Some of you have quite have seen them. Some of you have actually helped me do them. Um, so, uh, where's Keith? Can you hold this one for me, Keith? So, in the drought, our cattle were very short on feed. We'd fed them all our hay. We'd bought more and fed that to them. We had a few left, and so there was a bit of feed out in the road, and we took them out on the road, Mrs Chaffee and myself, and um, we had to put out signs to warn the traffic coming along that we had cattle on the road. We actually didn't have sheep. There's a sheep there, sign there, but we had cattle as well. So there were cattle out on the road, so the cars that were coming along wouldn't, would know to slow down, we hoped, and not run into them. It actually didn't slow them down, as it turned out. Um, but our cattle were well behaved. Uh, there you go. Now I might get Chloe to come over. Uh, there, so there's another sign as well. So Keith, you'll need help with this one. It's a heavy one. So this one is a sign we have when we take machinery on the, lo- on the road and it's, it's, really, it's wider than normal. And people might actually have to get off the road because this machine's coming behind us. About there, can you hold that? About there, yep. So it says, oversized load ahead. So when you're coming along um, and you see that vehicle in front, you'll know there's another machine coming well behind that and it's really wide or really long and you've got to get off the road. The other thing that happens is that there's lights that warn as well and flags. Um, so that that'll actually warn you what's happening. Um, So have any of you seen that, children? Have any of you seen that on the road, lights flashing? Sometimes they're red and blue lights. We saw a lot of red and blue lights racing to Gunnedah late last week. Yeah, Lockie? Um, Yep. Yeah, we've seen a lot of flashing lights on our road. there. Yeah. Um, so these things warn us and they help us to know what's dangerous. God loves us and he doesn't want us to be harmed. So he warns us uh, through his word in the Bible how to obey and to love him just like Jesus did. He tells us not, uh, not to read, just to read things in the Bible or to hear things in the Bible and go, Oh, yeah, I've heard that. That's it. He actually tells us to live them out. He li- tells us to live them out in our homes, at school, and anywhere else we are. And 
God actually says that it needs to be obvious. Um, it actually needs to be obvious that we're obeying him. It actually make us, might make us different to other people. It'd be almost like... It'd be almost like we had labels on our hands somewhere. Somewhere I've got a hat with a label on it as well, but it's disappeared. Labels on our hands. There we go. It'd almost be like we had labels on our heads and our hands and even our houses. Um, telling people that we were different, um, that we're actually obeying God. Um, the way we live may actually show other people um, that they're missing something in their lives. It might actually show people that the thing they're missing is God's love through Jesus' grace. Amen. Uh, children, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get clipboards and head back to seats. So there's no crash this morning, so little kitties will stay in. Oh, we've got a kid's song. Okay, well, I'll pray and then we'll do a kid's song. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you warn us in the Bible uh, to love you and to love our neighbours as ourselves. Thank you, Father, for Jesus who came to save us from any harm we might come to. Amen. And now we're actually going to have your sermon. So um, you might pull out your Bibles. Uh, we're looking at Deuteronomy. So particularly chapter, the first part of chapter 5 and the first part of chapter 6. Thanks, thanks Simon. Well, morning, everybody. Welcome this morning. You're all well? You look well? Excellent. Bow your heads with me. Now, Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us here in front of us your written word that not only teaches us how to live, but encourages us to live for you. Lord, I pray that we would listen to how we are to live for Jesus' sake. Amen. <clears throat> um, apologies. I'll just say that at the very beginning. Okay. Have you heard about the new silent tennis game? It's the game you play without the racket. Yep, dad jokes aside, just imagine for a moment playing tennis without nets, without lines, or without a racket. 
Um, now, if you're a tennis player, I imagine that probably wouldn't be much fun. Um, but of course, any game like that, um, without a, an agreed set of rules, would probably be chaos. Uh, in fact, it, when I was at high school, we used to play a game just like that. Uh, we called it mongrel ball uh, because it was a combination um, of football or soccer, if you don't know what football is, uh, AFL, rugby, um, and any other game you could think of. Um, and of course, um, it was chaos. In fact, it was so chaotic, sometimes you didn't even know who was on your team. So we come to Deuteronomy, and God's people are about to enter the promised land. And they're actually about to enter it as God's team, if you like. And there are some really big questions that are being asked um, of the people when they're entering the promised land. Like, who exactly are they now they've been rescued by God? Um, what will they look like among all of the many nations that they're going, um, who are living in the land? How will they be different? Uh, how will they live? How will they survive? How will they thrive in this land? All the while, while representing God to the people around them. Well, they're going to need some rules or they're going to need some boundaries, if you like, so that they know um, how they're going to live in the land. So our job today, um, as always, I guess, is to look at the text and to see how Deuteronomy might answer some of those questions the questions actually come back to God's law. Now, they're not necessarily laws as we understand them, as in the courts of law. Um, they are laws, but there's something much bigger, much deeper about them. You see, they are laws that will, if you like, will contain God's people. Um, and without giving too much away at the beginning, they're laws that are going to define what the people of God look like um, define the nature also of the game, if you could call it that, that they are going to play um, as they enter the promised land, but also as they move into this new period of history um, for God's people. So I've got three headings for you this morning, and the first one is the design of God's law. So Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. It was not with our ancestors that the Lord made this covenant, but with us, with all of us who are alive here today. The Lord spoke to you face to face out of the fire on the mountain. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 5 recalls uh, the giving of God's law to Israel on Mount Sinai or Horeb, same place. The laws are given um, a central role in establishing the shape and the character of God's people. Up to chapter 5, the book has described how the people have come to this point. What they're do what's happening now is that they are given regulations or rather reminded of the laws that God has already given them that will describe what they are meant to look like um, when they live in the land God is giving them. The first part, or the design of God's law, if you like, involves a covenant. Now, this is important, and the definition is up there, because a covenant is the formalisation of a relationship that doesn't exist naturally. So relationships that exist naturally don't need um, a covenant. Uh, for example, you don't need a covenant um, in, in a family with brothers um, and sisters and parents. Uh, there's no need uh, to enter into a formal relationship with those people because those relationships exist naturally. Um, also, for example, as God our creator doesn't need um, a covenant with what he has created. Um, there is already a creator-created creator relationship which exists by the very fact of our existence. However, if God chooses to make a particular kind of relationship, well, that relationship does need a covenant. And God does establish a particular relationship with the people of Israel a relationship that doesn't exist anywhere else or with anyone else at all. Now, by promise, 
by God's gracious act, God becomes the God of Israel. The design of God's law comes back to this covenant. God, if you like, establishes or initiates this relationship with Israel. That's why it's gracious. And he delivers his side of the relationship by declaring to the people what he will do for them by promise. So here in Deuteronomy, um, he delivers his side um, through the promise of this, in the covenant and through a mediator, Moses. The mediator then tells the people, outlines to them what's necessary for the relationship with God to work. Now, that's the second step. But the covenant, the beginning, the design of God's law, reflects the character of God. And that is in the Ten Commandments, which we didn't read, because I'm assuming you all know them off by heart, which you do, don't you? Good, excellent. Um, the covenant reflects the character of God, but also gives the people the tools to enter into a relationship with God. The groundwork, if you like, um, of what the relationship looks like, um, how the relationship will be displayed or manifest by his representatives in the world is given to us in the Ten Commandments. The design of God's law uh, is relational. God desires a relationship with his people and so he sets up the boundaries of what that relationship will look like. And, of course, they're based on what God is like. And he wants his people to be like him. Remember, we are created in his image. And so he wants us to behave like him. So he gives us the commandments, which point to his character. But also it has a double-barreled um, purpose of if the people are God-like in their communities, if they reflect his word uh, to the community, to the nations around them, then they will be fulfilling their part of the covenant. Anyway, the design then basically of God's law is that it is relational. He gives his heart to the people and he asks them to respond. And my, sec my second heading this morning then is the detail of God's law. And this is where we come to the Ten Commandments. In verse 6 we read, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery you shall have no other gods but me. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of them because as you've already assured me, you know them off by heart. But, but God's law, in note, is relational and it's delivered um, to his people through the promise of a relationship. But in order to deal with Deuteronomy properly, what we need to do is look at the detail of the response of God's people to the covenant promises that God has made to them. Now, I'm not going to go into detail in, of every single one of the Ten Commandments here, and I think I found a way that might summarise the detail of God's law. I mentioned earlier that the law here is not as we might understand it, um, like it's not to do with the court of law, for example. I mean, you might notice perhaps maybe one or two, but most of these laws here could not be prosecuted in a court. Um, and the, the reason for this is because they're actually essentially... Um, laws that call for people to love God. They're an appeal by God to the heart of people that they might have a change of heart toward God. <clears throat> Notice verse 6 uh, establishes God's love. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of slavery. Um, that's actually a summary of everything that's gone in the book before this. Everything that um, God has brought his people to this point, And this is what God has done to show that he loves them. The rest of the, the words, the rest of the ten words are in um, that part of Deuteronomy are asking a, for a response from the heart of God's chosen people. They are to respect who God is, as outlined in the commandments, and to respect the people that God has made in his image. Because the Ten Commandments can be broadly broken down into those two groups, can't they? You also know that, don't you? So as well as being a picture of what, God, of what love for God's look like, they will also show how the distinctive love for God 
will be played out in the lives of the people that God's chosen. Now, at university, uh, one of my friends expressed his love um, for his girlfriend a little bit like this. I would crawl through a valley of broken glass just to put toothpicks in your olives. Now it is, it's, it's, it's humorous too, isn't it? But it's poetic, don't you think? I mean, stop and think about it. What a beautiful expression of love. You're all laughing, but it's beautiful. You have to know this guy, I suppose, to know what he's saying. But what he's trying to say is he wants to tell her how much he loves her. And in declaring his love, he wants a response. This is what God's done. God, God has rescued his people. If you like, he's gone above and beyond. He's crawled through the valley of broken glass. He's declared his love to his people and now he's waiting for them to respond. Now, of course, with all, like all, um, with all love, a, a positive response is not guaranteed, is it? The, the book of Deuteronomy makes it clear that there, there are two options for God's people. They can actually, a positive response to God's love, so through obedience, um, will bring blessings to them. Um, a negative response through disobedience will bring curses for them. Nevertheless, though, as we go through Deuteronomy, what we will discover is, despite the predicted failure of God's people, several centuries later, or through all the centuries, up to the several centuries later, God will never give up on his love and his covenant and his promises with his people. Well, let's turn and look now at the last part, which is deep in God's law. And this is where we go to uh, chapter 6. I don't remember back to those days, you know, when you were young. Some people here don't have to remember back far. Um, you know, there was a person, you know, you might have seen them across the, the dance hall or wherever you see someone these days on WhatsApp or something like that. If, if, you, if you declare your love for that person, there's a risk, isn't there? There are no, no guarantees if you love someone and you go to them and tell them that you love them. Um, that's why some people actually never tell others of their love because it's risky. But notice that God, God is never reluctant to tell his people how much he loves them. I mean, he's done it in creating the world. He's done it in creating us. He's done it in the history we read in the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, we hear all the time what God has done to love his people. But what is the clue to our response? How are we supposed to respond? Well, that's where we come to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Uh, De Deuteronomy chapter 4, the first little part of that, um, sorry, chapter 6, verse 4, uh, is known as the Shema. So S H E M A. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, today, they form still the central part um, of Jewish prayers. Um, what they're doing is they are, are affirming the fact that God is king and that God is one. In fact, they, they're the central testimony um, in the whole Bible um, to what God is like, apart from Jesus, of course. Now, for God's people in Deuteronomy, this short little revelation and what comes after it is the framework for us to understand um, understanding what God is like and how to live within God's covenant. So we've, we've seen so far today that the design of God's law is for God 
to initiate a relationship with his people by covenant and promise. The detail of God's law is how we can have a relationship with God through obedience. But how are we meant to put into practice in the land in which God's people are living? The commandments and the laws. Well, Moses begins. There are three things. He begins, hear, O Israel. That is, hear. Hear. Moses doesn't call on people to look. There's no image of God that can contain God. Nor does he say, imagine what God is like. God calls on his people to listen to his own personal revelation of himself. In fact, when you go through Deuteronomy, um, especially in these few chapters, the words, oh, hear, O oh Israel, are mentioned quite a few times. There is no other God. Listen to what he is saying. Listen to what this God has revealed about himself. Hear, O oh people. Moses then goes on to say, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Those two words, listen and love, are closely linked together. Um, listening to God means listening to God alone. Um, listening to God means, as a unified people, God's people are called to be loyal to and to love God alone. More than that, though, with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength. Now, does that not suggest to you a loyalty to God that should begin in our very hearts? It should define who we are. Loyalty to God should be habitual. It should be something that we're thinking about every time we wake up in the morning. It should be cultural. It should inform the way that we teach our children and shape our culture. And we should do it with all of our energy, with everything that we have. Loyalty to God or love for God must leave no room for negligence or half-heartedness. If we listen to God, and we love God with all our heart and soul and strength. The question is, and how do we put God at front and centre in our lives? Well, it's suggested here by these words that God's law should become the part of us. God's law should be present in our homes. God's law should be our presence in the world. It should be like Greg said, it should be like we have a hat on our heads that declares Jesus is God. God is Lord. It should be like we're walking around with stickers on our wrists saying Jesus is Lord. Or like the Jews do, Orthodox Jews, they carry a little box of the Ten Commandments on their forehead to remind them that they are to live and to think the law. God's law should shape our home life. He says, impress it on your hearts and impress it on your children. It should, it should um, shape the way that we love each other as husbands and wives, as children, as brothers and sisters, as family, God's people. Listening and loving God must be in every part of our day. It must be there when we wake up in the morning. It must be there when we go to bed at night. In whatever we do, in everything and in everywhere we go, God's way should be right there in front of us. And in whatever we do and whatever we say, wherever we go, we are to make it obvious to people that we are living God's way. Now I know that many of you probably at this point are thinking, well, well I'm a bit of a failure in that. I mean, I certainly feel like that. But I, I want, Deuteronomy goes on to say something really extraordinary. 
towards the end. In chapter 30, let me read it for you. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. Now, what I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend to heaven to get it and bring it down to us so that we might obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea and proclaim it to us so that we might obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you might obey it. He goes on to say, See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him and to keep his commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. What I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is in your mouth and it is in your heart so you may obey it. If we listen to God, if we seek to love God, we will live for God. Brothers and sisters, if what God asks those in the book of Deuteronomy is not beyond their reach... How much more so is what God asks us within our reach because of what we know about Jesus? Are you a failure in all of that? God has given us his son, Jesus, to stand in our place. God has spoken. We have it here in front of us. We must listen. God has spoken to us particularly through his son in the last days, it says in Hebrews, through the prophets, but today through his son. So we must listen to his son. And like the people in Deuteronomy, God calls us to be his people. And he calls us to be his people in the world. Salt and light. Last week, we had a beautiful wedding, Samson and Keeley's wedding. Um, I was just reminded in the wedding of the words of the consent at the beginning of the wedding. Um, I won't use their names, I'll use... So these are the words of the consent. Um, Simon, will you take Jenny to be your wife, to live together according to God's law? Will you give her the honour due to her and forsaking all others, love and protect her as long as you both shall live? The answer, I will. You know, once upon a time that question was slightly different. It was, Simon, do you take Jenny? Why do you think it changed? Well, it changed because do is present. Yeah, I do. I'll do it today, but I might change my mind and might do it tomorrow. I will is present, continuous. I will from this day and forever. Can you go to the next slide, Soph? I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. Three questions, actually, and I want you to answer it out loud. You know what you have to answer? Will you? I will. God's people, will you listen to God's word? Will you love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength? And will you live displaying God to the world? I will too. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you that you've given us your word. We thank you that it's written here for us. We thank you that we hear in this the wonderful news that Jesus died for us. We thank you, Lord, that in his death we are empowered to live for you. Father, you've heard the words that have come out of our mouths today. 
We will listen. We will love. We will live for you. Help us, for we are weak. In Jesus' name. Amen. You might just take a moment to reflect on how you're listening and loving God and how that will affect your lives. Following that, we're going to sing again and then Tim will bring us a prayer spot. Please stand with me and we will sing our next song. Consider Christ, the source of our salvation, that he should take the penalty for me though he was pure a lamb without a blemish he took my sins and nailed them to the tree my lord and god you are so rich in mercy That was reserved for me
be seated. We're going to have a time of prayer, and then after that, Jenny will bring us a women's committee report. Uh, please join me as we pray. Uh, we'll start with the parish vision prayer. Heavenly Father, you have spoken to us and called us to make disciples and to be salt and light in the world. We ask you to equip us for our calling. We are frail, but desire to honour that call. So work in us to make us salt and light, flavouring our community and drawing people to walk with us, uh, to walk with Jesus by shining the light of the good news into others' lives. Thank you for graciously loving us and teaching us to graciously love others. Ephesians 4 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. There is one body, sorry, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope where you were co- when you were called. Lord, thank you that you have called us through the one hope and love that is your Spirit. Help us to love you with all our hearts and all our souls and with all our strength. Help us to love one another as you loved us, making every effort to keep the unity and peace and reconcile to one another. Help us to grow as one church and one body of Christ. Dear Lord, thank you for the upcoming PeaceWise Talks on the 25th of May. Help us to increasingly grow into a people full of your peace, love and forgiveness, displaying the same mercy to others that you display to us on the cross. Lord, thank you for the gift of your word that we have heard today. Thank you that we can freely read, study, interpret this. And thank you, Lord, for the gifted leaders you have given us to help us explain this and practically apply it each day. Lord, we pray for the upcoming church camp. We pray that many would be able to attend and we pray for all the volunteers who have offered to help. Dear Lord, thank you for all the planning that has been put into this by so many. And we pray that it would be a time when the church family may be able to grow closer together. And out of this, dear Lord, we also pray for the upcoming Hope Explored course. We pray that this would be a great time of encouragement. Please soften the hearts of those you have called to attend this, dear Lord, and it might be a great time of change in their lives. Lord, we thank you for your church, and we thank you that it is made up of so many parts, and that you give each of us gifts to glorify you. Help us to work together as one body and to be a pillar of faith and love in our community. We pray for the many ministries that our church here has. We pray that your wisdom will be upon them through all their events and interactions and help them to focus on loving you and glorifying you through all that they do. Lord, we pray for our link missionaries and all those missionaries across the world carrying out your word, dear Lord. We pray for their protection and that you would sustain them. We pray, Lord, that we would be generous in our support of them through our thoughts, our prayers, and our giving so that their works may be able to continue. We pray for those who are sick, ill, and recovering in our congregation, dear Lord. We pray that you may be their rock and refuge during this time. And finally, Lord, we pray that this week we may go out and be salt and light in our community, a light in the dark, and show show hope to those who have none. Lord, we pray all these things in your Son's name. Amen. Morning. Uh, Simon asked me to briefly fill you in on what the Women's Ministry Committee it does. Uh, we're a small group of women who want to facilitate opportunities for the women in our congregation to grow in their faith, to encourage each other to press on and speak to friends and neighbours about Jesus. We're keen for more mature Christians, Christian women, to look out for and stand alongside those who are newer in their faith or younger in years through the whole range of experiences and challenges we face in our life. Lately, we've been reviewing what we do and how we do it, and this has meant thinking through our vision and mission, what that is and how it sits under the church's vision and mission as a whole. So, so far we've come up with this. God has spoken to us through his word, calling us to make disciples and be salt and light by teaching 
encouraging and caring for the women in our church and in our community. Earlier this year, we hosted a women's breakfast, largely for our own congregation. And what better way to start the day than with coffee, reverence, pastries, and a devotion in Psalm 73. On June the 22nd, ladies, will you have the opportunity to listen to a live stream of the Equip Conference, a one-day women's conference. This year, the talks are entitled Hope for the Weary and will be on Revelation chapters one to five. Some of the speakers you may be familiar with, Di Warren and Annabel Nixie, are amongst them. The Women's Ministry Committee supports and encourages women to attend our own diocese's women's conference called New Life in September. And finally, uh, we have listened to feedback and towards the end of the year, we'll be running a gingerbread house event again, which will include an evangelistic talk and will be something you can invite your friends to. I said earlier that we're a small group and we're praying for others to join us. If you think this might be an area in which you have gifts to offer, can I encourage you to pray about it and speak to myself or another member of the committee? So Gay's here, um, Anne, um, Helen Anderson, I think's away at the moment. Um, Bethany's pulling back for obvious reasons. Um, or if you have new, fresh ideas, as to how we can meet the needs of women more effectively, then we'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me pray for the Women's Committee. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Um, we do thank you for your word, firstly, um, and we thank you for that team of people seeking to reach out um, to women, encouraging them to be disciple makers, um, to be growing themselves as disciples and to be salt and light in the world. Father, as they um, seek new members and new ideas, guide them by your spirit um, that what we do may always be pleasing to you for your sake. Amen. We are going to sing our final song which is Amazing Grace. Uh, then we'll conclude the service and have a cuppa together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all kings this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place
Well, I'll pray and then we'll head for a cuppa. Heavenly Father, thanks you are an amazing God. Thanks for your amazing grace in sending Jesus to die and rise for us. Pray, Father, you'd help us as we go this week to think about how we live for you, um, how we love others around us, and uh, how we show that um, you're the most important thing in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.